Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining our seminar session today. Um, I would like to introduce our today's speaker, Dejan Mihailov. Um, Dejan <clears throat> holds a, a bachelor's degree from the Minnesota State University in physics and a master's degree from North Dakota State University, as well as his PhD from North Dakota State University, which he earned in 2019 where he studied the excited state properties of semiconductor nanostructures using many-body perturbation theory. Um, they joined the Rochester LLE theory group in 2019 as an assistant scientist, and his research interests are focused on the application of finite temperature DFT and non-equilibrium screens function methods to improve the description of matter under extreme condition, and now especially in this talk, uh, Warm dense matter. So, uh, Dayan, the stage is yours. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I can hear you. I can also see your screen. All right. Um, okay. Well, good afternoon to you guys. Uh, good morning to uh, anyone from. Uh, the LLE, I'm not sure if anyone from, from our group joined. Um, uh, thanks for the invite, first of all. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, improving the accuracy of density functional theory simulations of warm dense matter by including exchange correlation thermal effects. And I will be uh, talking about these new functionals that we have developed. Um, and uh, I will uh, use words like uh, T scanel. Uh, can, can can you can you see my cursor? Uh, by the way. Um, yes, I can see your cursor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so my, <laughs> you can still yeah. see. Okay. So I'm yes, saying I things like, yeah. T scanel and uh, KDT sixteen. I'll explain what those are. Those are uh, 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 the, the new exchange correlation, the new thermal exchange correlation functionals that we, we have developed in our group. Uh, and I will be comparing them to other exchange correlation functionals that uh, you might have already heard, like uh, PBE. Uh, and I will be comparing some, some results for um, optical properties such as uh, electronic band gap, um, at uh, different temperatures and uh, uh, also uh, pressures uh, at different temperatures. Um, and uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll be comparing them to, to uh, ground state exchange correlation functionals uh, and uh, uh, for different uh, uh, systems like uh, uh, for different systems of interest to high energy density physics like helium, hydrogen, and so on. Uh, a quick line, outline of my talk, I will briefly introduce the laboratory for laser energetics and our group high energy density physics. Uh, then I'll uh, just uh, quickly give a motivation for our work uh, present here and uh, a warm dense matter regime. Uh, I'll give a very quick intro to density functional theory and also thermal density functional theory. Um, and uh, I will also, then I'll introduce uh, uh, this, uh, uh, what's often referred to as Jacob's ladder of exchange correlation functional approximations. And uh, um, I will compare the ground state and the thermal exchange correlation functionals. Um, and then I'll introduce the new and advanced thermal exchange correlation functionals that we have developed, and I'll show some early results for optical properties and equation of state in systems of interest uh, to high energy density physics, and uh, I'll end up with some conclusions. Uh, we are uh, over here in the, this is the northeast part of the United States, this is the state of New York uh city of new york is like around here uh boston is like around here we are in the western part of new york state uh kind of like on, on lake ontario uh 
Niagara Falls is right up here north of Buffalo. Um, and our lab does inertial confinement fusion mostly and uh, using laser direct drive. Um, so what uh, uh, inertial confinement fusion with lasers is, is um, if you look at the figure on the bottom, on the far left, uh, you have a, a spherical capsule. Um, inside the spherical capsule is uh, deuterium, tritium fuel. And it is coated with uh, some ablator material, which is usually plastic or um, um, but recently there has been uh, um, um, some advances in, in the composition of the uh, ablator material, like um, uh, a, a diamond, a pure carbon, or uh, some um, uh, could be doped too and you irradiate this uh, capsule with lasers from all directions. And um, uh, we have um, here the Omega laser facility, which is a very powerful laser. It uh, has 60 beams and it can deliver up to 40 kilojoules at up to 60 terawatts of power to this uh, one this uh, one millimeter diameter diameter target, and uh, um, what happens is the ablator material kind of explodes, right? And it blows off, and uh, and in in this explosion, the the fuel inside is compressed uh, to very uh, dense and hot uh, conditions, and um, uh, so why deuterium tritium is because they can fuse to make a uh, alpha particle, which is uh, like a helium, uh, which is like the, the helium, the nucleus of a helium atoms, two protons and two neutrons. Uh, and it also uh, creates uh, another neutron, uh, very energetic. Um, so it creates a alpha particle and a, and a neutron to fly off at uh, very high kinetic energy. And uh, once you achieve ignition, that means fusion reactions happen, uh, start happening, and alpha particles and neutrons start flying off and they, uh, they heat up the rest of the fuel and generate more and more uh, fusion, react fusion reactions. And um, uh, the reaction propagates and the fuel burns and you create much, much more energy than you have um, uh, put in. Um, so uh, I, uh, I don't know if you've heard recently there uh, this um, uh, uh, this ignition uh, stage was uh, uh, nearly achieved in in uh, uh, the National Ignition Facility in California, which is part of the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And just to compare to the LLE, uh, they just have a uh, much more powerful laser. Theirs is up to, uh, goes up to 1.8 megajoules at 500 terawatts and uses 192 beams. Uh, also, they don't do direct drive, they do laser indirect drive, where uh, the target is, in, is uh, inside a little uh, hollow cylinder, and the laser it hits the walls of the cylinder, generates x-rays, and, and those x-rays um, hit the target, and, uh, and that's what, that's what uh, causes the, um, uh, uh, the drive, the, the indirect x-rays. So we do different uh, different type, uh, right? Uh, different approach to fusion, but and we also have like less powerful lasers than uh, the National Ignition Facility, which you might have heard of. Uh, this is our group here. It's an old picture, uh, kind of. Since then, we've uh, added uh, several grad students and even uh, one more uh, postdoc. Um, 
this is uh, Valentin Karasev on the on the left here with the sunglasses. Uh, I'll be I'm mentioning his name uh, a lot because he's uh, mainly behind uh, the development of uh, exchange correlation uh, thermal functionals. So uh, I got to talk about the warm dense matter regime, although most of you probably know what it is. Uh, it um, lies somewhere between uh, classical plasma regime and the condensed matter regime in this temperature density uh, 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 space here, and is traversed uh, very much so by the imploding uh, shell, which is the red line right here, it goes through these conditions right through the warm dense matter regime. So very important to ICF, also very important to planetary physics as um, large planets like Jupiter and also stars um, uh, lie somewhere in this um, in this regime. Um, you can't really apply uh, standard plasma physics to this regime because they're inaccurate because quantum mechanical effects are still important. Um, also, uh, well, what need, one needs to do is take uh, uh, methods from condensed matter at low temperatures, but applying them to the warm dense matter regime is challenging because of um, multiple reasons. One is that those methods don't really have uh, temperature dependence, uh, explicit temperature dependence in them, because um, when they were developed, um, um, no one really bothered to include explicit temperature dependence because um, they were developed with uh, zero temperature or room temperature in mind. So if you try to uh, go take those methods into the warm dense matter regime, uh, you first have to do some temp uh, some method development. Uh, also, uh, there is a significant increase in computational cost as temperature rises um, based on what kind of method you use, but in most of them, that's for most of them that's true. And another big challenge is they are, even if you find some, you know, um, established methodology with uh, uh, the proper consideration of temperature um, that are practical for calculation in the warm dense matter regime, they're not really part of any available uh, codes out there for, uh, um, for, for um, that are suited for high performance computing. Uh, so in this talk, I'll focus on density functional theory, which has uh, established itself as one of the most uh, um, successful methods for for for, for uh, condensed matter uh, that um, can correctly describe the uh, many body quantum system in the uh, at low temperatures, and also. Um, uh, DFT has been combined uh, with uh, many body perturbation theory very successfully, um, such as the DFT plus GW plus Bethesel Peter uh, method to correctly uh, describe excited states. Also, time dependent DFT has been um, uh, very successful in uh, um, kind of like post DFT. Uh, uh, as a post DFT method, since density functional theory is uh, technically a, a ground state theory. Uh, so if you want to do excitations, you have to go beyond DFT, but you can use uh, DFT for that, uh, which is part of its success. Uh, so in this talk, uh, well, I will talk about extending DFT uh, into the warm dense matter regime. Um, by developing uh, temperature dependent exchange correlation functionals, uh, which can be uh, readily implemented in uh, modern uh, uh, codes that, uh, uh, that, that do DFT. Um, okay, so quick introduction uh, to DFT. Uh, I'll try to keep this as quick as possible. Um, so um, 
in the ground state in the zero temperature, which is um, you know what what DFT is originally designed for. Um, one can uh, the DFT allows to, you to reduce the uh, uh, many body problem to a single body problem. Uh, all right, that that is um, kind of like uh, what uh, makes DFT doable. It is because you can um, act on a single particle orbital. Uh, I don't want to call it a wave function because it's not uh, that's not technically accurate. But let's these phi sub i's they're orbitals. They're called Consham orbitals, and um, it, uh, you can act on a single Consham orbital with a, with an operator. Right, and uh, uh, you get an eigenvalue problem. Um, all right, where it only uh, contains one orbital. All right, and uh, so this is the the this is how the many body problem is reduced to one. So why that is um, why that works? Uh, it's tied to the, the uh, Hohenberg cone theorem, um, which you know one can. Uh, uh, get into great detail, um, uh, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, I will just uh, mention that um, um, uh, I will just mention the main uh, you know, philosophy behind DFT, uh, and that is um, it puts uh, the uh, fully it maps the fully interacting system. It's mapping is kind of important. Maps the fully interacting system to a system of non-interacting consham orbitals, right? Non-interacting particles described by these consham orbitals, which are in a potential, uh, and uh, what this is, uh, this sub V sub S, which is referred to as a consham potential. Uh, in, in this potential, will give the uh, correct density that corresponds to the exactly to the density of the fully interacting system. And the total energy of the system is a functional uh, of that density. And the uh, Hohenberg cone theorem tells you that there is exact one-to-one -one mapping between um, uh, uh, the density, the uh, energy, and the potential, which is why you can really do that. Um, so inside this Consham potential, you have a hard return, which corresponds to like the classical um, uh, interaction between um, static charges. Um, and um, you have uh, external potential uh, between ions and um, electrons. And this is usually, uh, um, uh, one usually uses a pseudo potential um, for this term, for the external potential, and you have this exchange correlation potential, which is obtained by varying the exchange correlation functional with respect to the density, and provided that one knows this energy functional of the density, all right, that corresponds to the exchange. Uh, interaction between the ions and also the correlation. And okay, so um, the finite temperature, um, uh, version of uh, DFT also called as, uh, referred to as Mermin Consham DFT. One has pretty much the same uh, uh, kind of, uh, um, uh, one has pretty much the same uh, methodology, only uh, when uh, the density is constructed from uh, the cone sham orbitals, uh, one has the Fermi Dirac uh, distribution, uh, which uh, is uh, a function of uh, temperature. So in the uh, 
Mermin Konshan formalism one has a temperature dependent density. Um, right? And uh, in the ground state uh, DFT one has a temperature independent density. Uh, so uh, when you have a temperature dependent density and you have, uh, uh, once you obtain these uh, 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 Konsheim orbitals, right? This, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, this is this is the algorithm here. You you start with a guess for the density. You construct the potential. Um, you act on the Konsheim orbitals, right? Um, you solve this eigenvalue problem. You obtain the Konsheim orbitals, the energies. Um, you uh, and then you update the density, and you solve this iteratively until you minimize the energy. Uh, so in the finite temperature formalism, um, one uses these Konsheim orbitals to construct the, uh, the non-interacting entropy and add it to the um, uh, total energy to obtain the free energy, right? And so to add it to the internal energy to obtain the free energy. But uh, uh, technically, the exchange correlation energy is should itself uh, be free energy. All right, and it should have an explicit temperature dependence. And uh, in this case, um, uh, you technically should have exchange correlation entropy as well as uh, uh, the uh, exchange correlation uh, internal energy. So um, currently in most modern packages, uh, everyone is working with this EXC independent of temperature when it technically it should have uh, temperature dependence and it should include um, exchange correlation entropic effects. So this is um, kind of like where our work uh, lies in. Uh, this uh, uh, F uh, sub X C quantity exchange correlation for the energy. Um, so, uh, so far, um, 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 let me introduce uh, um, what's known as the Jacobs ladder of zero temperature exchange correlation functionals. Uh, you may have heard of uh, a lot of those um, such as the PVE, the B leap uh, uh, functional, the B3 leap functionals, but you can uh, uh, generalize the exchange correlation functionals um, that exist so far in terms of this uh, ladder, where at the bottom rung you have the not so accurate, but uh, you know computationally less expensive ones. Um, uh, right here, right above the Hartree-Fock uh, level of theory. And it's called the local density approximation, the exchange, co uh, the uh, energy, uh, exchange correlation energy function depends on density only. Um, and when you include uh, corrections due to dependence on the gradient of the density, you get the GGA of the generalized gradient approximation level. And this is where PBE functional is. Above this, uh, you can have a dependence on the Laplacian of the density or uh, the kinetic energy uh, density. And this is where your computational cost kind of increases uh, a little bit, but you obtain a level, of, a higher level of accuracy. And above that, you can um, have dependence on the uh, exact exchange, uh, right? As, it, as, it's in, uh, as it's done in Hartzifog, you can have, um, um, uh, part of the exact uh, exchange, oh, right? You you don't have to uh, lump up the ex, ex, uh, the exchange and correlation into one piece. You can use some of the parts of the exact exchange, and you gain uh, accuracy here. And especially uh, this le uh, level here, a hybrid level, is what's referred to this green uh, uh, this green one here. 
uh, hybrid level of DFT is uh, much more computationally costly, but it gives you accuracy, especially for things like the band gap. Uh, so, so far, uh, there have been some uh, uh, exchange correlation functionals developed at the LDA level of theory and the GGA level of theory. Um, at the LDA level, we have the KSDT functional. Uh, KSDT stands for Karasyov Duffy Tricky. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, KSDT stands for Karasyov Siostrom Duffy Tricky. Uh, and uh, uh, that was developed. Uh, 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 so K, the K Karasev is uh, Valentin Karasev, which is part of our group here at the LLE. Um, and uh, that was that was developed, uh, uh, I think, around uh, 20, uh, 2014, 2016. Um, KDT-16, uh, Karasov, Karasov, Dafti, Tricky, fun, uh, uh, functional. And the GGA level of theory is a uh, finite temperature version of the PBE functional. Um, all right. Um, so uh, these uh, uh, functionals ha uh, have already been developed and constructed, and you know proven to uh, to um, uh, correctly take exchange correlation effects into effect. Um, but uh, we need to go up uh, the ladder in accuracy, right? Um, and one, uh, uh, well the the way the way uh, uh, kind of what, the way people do this uh, you know uh, as as a first approximation is using uh, lower level using functionals from lower level rungs to construct more advanced functionals with higher accuracy at the upper rungs and this is what we did um, uh, uh, first is we constructed the kdt zero functionals, uh, KT zero hybrid functional, which is a finite temperature extension of the PBE functional. And um, th this functional is uh, um, constructed by taking the KT 16 correlation and, uh, also, and three quarters of KDT 16 exchange. And um, using one quarter of Harter Fock exchange, which is also free energy and includes explicit temperature dependent. Um, so, if you, uh, this is a, a finite temperature version of the PBE function. So, the, the, the PBE zero, sorry, the PBE zero functional would here have. Um, uh, exchange, uh, uh, we'll have PBE correlation and PBE exchange. Uh, but since we have the KDT16 functional, it's, uh, it's like substituting PBE for uh, KDT16. And um, so since hybrid functionals are kind of designed to improve um, uh, the band gap and the valence uh, uh, band structure, we're, we're going to look at the uh, band gap um, of silicon, uh, bulk silicon uh, in cubic diamond at, uh, as we increase electronic temperature, but keeping ionic temperature at zero. Uh, so ions don't move. Uh, we only increase uh, electronic temperature and we want to see what happens um, to, the, to the band gap. Um, so the band gap of silicon is uh, 1.12 eV at room temperature and uh, finite temperature GW, which is a many body perturbation theory. Um, uh, uh, it's not, uh, in this case, it's not based on DFT. Um, it is very accurate, uh, but very computationally costly. Uh, and it captures the band gap very well. And um, at high temperatures, at, uh, as, as one increases the, uh, the temperature, uh, you can see that the gap decreases. 
uh, as a function of temperature. Uh, according to um, uh, GW. And um, this is also seen in uh, experiments such as uh, ultra fast pump probe experiments. Uh, they see that the electronic gap actually does decrease uh, as, as one goes up in temperature. So um, DFT alone is not very good for band gap calculations, right? Um, so hybrid functional such as PBE0 and HSC06 are um, designed to uh, more accurately describe the band gap. But in the case of silicon, PBE0, the blue curve, overestimates it and PBE severely underestimates it, right? Um, so uh, I don't have HSC06 here, but uh, HSC06 is pretty close to, uh, to finite temperature GW. But anyways, uh, so uh, see that at zero temperature, DFT struggles with the band gap. But hybrids like PBE0 show the correct qualitative trend. All right, the blue curve, um, PBE0 shows uh, with, with PBE0, you, you pretty much get uh, the correct curve shifted by like some, you know, um, pretty much constant. And um, what we see is when we include exchange correlation thermal effects, the red dashed curve is uh, at high temperatures, exchange correlation thermal effects push this um, uh, curve of the gap as a function of temperature closer to, uh, to find a temperature GW. And uh, uh, the purple and the orange curve are the GGA functionals. They're um, you know way off. Uh, they underestimate the gap and they and they, they show the um, uh, wrong qualitative trend. But uh, exchange correlation thermal effects in KDT zero again show um, a decrease in the in the band gap. Uh, so um, for silicon, you know, not much um, correction to the gap at higher temperatures. Um, but uh, so we looked at the other systems of interest to high energy density physics and ICF. Um, on the far left here, I have polystyrene, uh, which is a polymer used as a blader in uh, ICF uh, targets at uh, ambient density, 1.06 grams per cubic centimeter. And uh, uh, we applied uh, hybrids, uh, PB0, a thermal hybrid KT0, and uh, GGA, uh, ground state PBE, and uh, thermal GGA KDT16. Um, uh, so we don't, we don't have experimental data on the band gap uh, here. Uh, Oh no, sorry. Actually, we do since this since this was published. It's around four point one, I think, at uh, at uh, room temperature. Again, hybrids uh, overestimated, uh, GGAs underestimated, and as temperature increases, um, um, uh, we we see the kind of a correct qualitative trend due to hybrids, um, band gap uh, decreases the function of temperature, but not much difference between the blue curve and the and the dashed red curve. As exchange correlation thermal effects are are not as important in these systems. Uh, this is methane ice at um, uh, zero point four three grams per cubic centimeter, and here we see huge uh, uh, correction due to exchange correlation thermal effects at high temperatures, right? Again, GGAs are the orange and the green curve on the bottom, the hybrid curves. Um, and in ice, uh, again, we see, uh, uh, you know, big corrections. Here, the uh, uh, exper uh, here the, the 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 gaps at zero temperature. I think for methane um, ice is uh, between nine and ten, uh, and uh, for waters I think it's between seven and eight. 
but uh, uh, anyways, the, the, the main point, I guess, is that with thermal hybrids, we get both the qualitative uh, trend of the gap of the energy gap as a function of temperature, which is that it decreases, right? And uh, when you include exchange correlation thermal effects, right? When you, when you take thermal effects into account in the exchange correlation, you, you could see a huge difference. Um, and also another conclusion we made is that this uh, huge correction to the gain, to the uh, band gap as a function of temperature um, it could be uh, could depend very much on the system. Uh, for example, in crystalline silicon, uh, you don't see this correction, uh, the relative correction to the band gap in percent. You don't see that peak until. Um, uh, much higher temperatures um, uh, than, for example, in uh, water, which means it's also uh, uh, very much depends on conditions. In uh, diamond, this is carbon. Um, this is the, uh, the orange curve is, is diamond. Um, and in diamond, we don't uh, really see much uh, effect at all. Um, so, um, yeah, the system dependent and condition dependent um, um, for this uh, exchange correlation thermal effects at the hybrid level. Um, moving on uh, to um, now molecular dynamics, right? So before we were holding ions fixed. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, for a warm dense matter regime, we very much want to move, right, be able to move the, the ions. Um, so molecular dynamics driven by DFT uh, has been a very successful tool for um, uh, simulating thermodynamic properties and the warm dense matter regime. Uh, the molecular dynamics algorithm, you start with uh, some um, ion distribution you calculate the density. Uh, um, well, start with ion distribution. Then you go into the DFT step, you guess the density, you calculate the effective potential uh, with the help of pseudo potential. You solve the Consham equations. Uh, it's this one uh, at the bottom here. Um, you obtain your uh, Consham energies and Consham orbitals. Um, you can construct the free energy as a function of density. And uh, you do this until you uh, have minimized. Um, all right, uh, you, so after your initial guess, you won't be at the minimum. You update the density. You do the whole step again. You will be closer to a minimum. And you, right, and you iteratively do this DFT step until you minimize the free energy. And once you do, you update the ionic positions and velocities. Right. And uh, again, here we have uh, um, um, uh, similar DFT uh, equations that I showed earlier. Um, at, uh, uh, we, they're used to drive uh, this um, um, equation of classical equation of motion, which is applied to the ions. All right, the potential that is used to move uh, to move uh, the ions is uh, determined uh, uh, is is determined with uh, density functional theory, where for the exchange correlation piece we have our um, uh, uh, exchange correlation temperature dependent uh, free energy. So. Uh, quick uh, introduction kind of like to our motivation for uh, developing uh, 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 the uh, thermal uh, uh, version of the scan l functional um, is um, uh, a recent work by uh, uh, one of our grad students josh hints and uh, also uh, Valentin was uh, involved in this project is they uh, used uh, scan L 
which is a meta GGA ground state exchange correlation functional. It is a um, the orbitalized version of um, the if you heard of the scan functional scan L is um, is is like that. I'll explain in a little bit how it's different. It's very successful in predicting the insulator to metal transition boundary in uh, hydrogen. And um, here is the uh, thermal scan L functional at the meta GGA level of theory. Um, and uh, uh, it depends on the Laplacian of the density. Here on the, on the uh, very left here, we have dependence on the Laplacian of the density. And the original scan functional, which is also very popular and successful, depends on this tau, which is the kinetic energy density. But they they uh, pr they produce sim they produce a pretty much identical results, and um, we introduced the thermal scan L functional, which is uh, constructed from the ground state scan L exchange correlation plus an additive uh, correction at the GGA level, which is defined as the difference between uh, KDT sixteen free energy and uh, uh, PBE uh, uh, energy, um, right, internal energy. Uh, so in the limit of temperature going to zero, uh, this uh, delta uh, F here, or the uh, additive correction to the scanner functional goes to zero. And also, uh, so therefore, this whole uh, piece here, the thermal scanel free energy will reduce to, to the scanel. But at higher temperatures, you take th th uh, thermal effects into account through the KDT16 functional. Uh, we apply this to helium. Uh, and this is actual molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, on the left is helium at 0.5 GCC. On the right is helium at 1 GCC. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, uh, low temperatures, uh, the blue curve is the ground state scan nail functional. Um, and the uh, uh, red dashed curve is the KDT16 functional, which at low temperature reduces to PBE. So um, this here um, uh, is uh, the pressures, uh, uh, pressures with respect uh, uh, with respect to PBE, relative difference in the pressures with respect to PBE. So as one should expect, KDT16 goes to zero here because it's you know, identical to PBE. It, uh, at low temperatures, but look at the difference, right? A huge correction due to scanl and uh, instead of using PBE. Right? So scanl, pretty you know, huge, you know, a huge increase in accuracy when you go from PBE to to scanl at low temperatures. So um, uh, with um, so right, this is one of the motivations for for for. Uh, developing this thermal scan L is because you will, now you have this um, uh, uh, increase in accuracy as well. Uh, and thermal scan L is here, the, the red curve, right? It reduces to scan L at low temperatures, but at high temperatures, uh, right? It uh, provides a significant correction to the ground state scan L, which is the blue curve, right? So at intermediate, right, intermediate temperatures around one EV, uh, you have a huge correction to the blue curve. And uh, all right, so and naturally at very high temperatures, scan L joins with uh, KDT16, uh, and then uh, eventually they all join together because. Uh, you know, it doesn't exchange correlation. Thermal effects at very, very high temperatures, uh, you know, uh, reduced to, and exchange correlation effects themselves reduced to zero. Um, right. Uh, here is uh, um, uh, some results for hydrogen. Uh, 
uh, although these are static electronic temperature calculations with uh, with fixed ions. And here we see we see the same um, the, the same picture um, uh, retaining the accuracy of meta GGA at low temperatures and uh, including uh, exchange correlation thermal effects in the high temperature uh, uh, results in this um, uh, kind of important uh, and pretty significant correction at, like right, between like. Uh, or 3 EV and uh, 15 EV. Uh, so this uh, served as a motivation to um, um, calculate the equation of state for uh, deuterium. Um, uh, so here's the temperature density plot of our uh, equation of state. Um, uh, blue circles is uh, uh, concham uh, molecular dynamics. And uh, purple circle is purple circus is orbital free uh, DFT, the molecular dynamics driven by orbital free DFT. Uh, right, they, they all they, they both use thermal scan L as the exchange correlation. Uh, I won't have time to get into uh, orbital free DFT. Uh, in orbital free DFT, one uh, uses an approximation for the kinetic energy. Um, and uh, at uh, at very high temperatures, uh, where um, where the where the density is more or less uniform, uh, one gets uh, um, pretty much um, one gets pretty good agreement between orbital free and um, Consham DFT. But uh, 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 here at very high temperatures, Consham DFT becomes prohibitively expensive you know, because of this uh, Fermi Dirac uh, smearing. You have many, many partially occupied orbitals that you now need to include in your uh, calculation, and uh, that grows pretty much exponentially and um, becomes uh, intractable very fast at high temperatures. So one needs orbital-free uh, approximation. Um, uh, so thermal scan L provides uh, uh, improved accuracy. Uh, for uh, equation of state properties, um, and it's not prohibitively expensive to use to to use as a driver for molecular dynamics. Uh, and this uh, deuterium is important uh, as it's uh, a fuel for um, uh, ICF capsules. Um, uh, so let me show you some quick results um, um, from. Uh, our uh, updated equation of state table. So when you uh, uh, compress uh, the target, you want to go along the adiabat, uh, uh, this dashed curve over here. But if you compress it with a single shock, you will go along the Hugonio. With Hugonio is determined uh, by uh, uh, solving um, uh, the uh, uh, all the uh, uh, but, but by taking uh, the Hugonio is uh, determines the um, energies, pressures, and densities uh, on each side of a shocked system, uh, and those are determined, uh, you know, by applying all the conservation uh, relations um, to 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 uh, to a shock front. Uh, so in ICF experiments, one usually shocks uh, um, uh, the target multiple times to kind of go uh, along the ADA path, uh, you know, as much as possible right? uh, to minimize the um, heat transfer. Uh, so uh, once you have an equation of state, you can figure out, you can determine the Hugonium, right? Uh, once you have energies and pressures and different temperature and density conditions, you can determine the Hugonio. And there has been many uh, uh, experiments and models for uh, deuterium uh, out there. Uh, the green one is um, is our uh, what we refer to as IFPOS, uh, based on thermal scan L. Um, uh, so, uh, 
one of the main one of our main conclusions uh, here uh, in this work was that um, at the high pressure, high temperature regime, uh, we still see uh, kind of like significant disagreement with um, with some of the latest uh, uh, experimental measurements. Uh, this uh, high temperature regime above like 300 GPAs is very uh, difficult to access uh, experimentally. But recently, there's been some uh, some some progress on it. These uh, red diamonds uh, and um, a, you know equation of state models that agree with uh, with with uh, with these experimental measurements are are very wrong at the low temperature uh, low, low uh, pressure regime. And uh, uh, there, uh, uh, um, some of them are not uh, uh, even first principles based, but there are chemical models. Um, others uh, that are based on DFT and, uh, and uh, DFT with molecular dynamics um, are um, uh, way off at the high pressure regime, but uh, more accurate at the, at the at the low pressure regime. Uh, so uh, our new thermal functional uh, T scanner uh, didn't seem to close that gap at the high pressure regime. Right. So uh, um, we we consider it you know very accurate at, at the low pressure regime, uh, but. Uh, 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 not so much in the high pressure regime. And um, it, when you look at the uh, secondary shock Hugo Neo, um, here on the right, uh, at, the, at the very high pressure regime above 60 GPA, this uh, disagreement between theory and experiment uh, grows, even, um, grows even bigger. Uh, so, um, so that was um, uh, kind of like our main conclusion from from looking at uh, this um, uh, this high pressure regime. Um, so one meta GGA level functionals, uh, even with exchange correlation thermal effects, were not enough to um, to close the gap between theory and experiment. But uh, so there is still uh, much work probably to be done in terms of theory here. Um, it to be uh, one has to include physics that are probably beyond um, DFT, and also um, apparently there is you know, um, work to be done in uh, accessing that region experimentally as one needs more accurate uh, experimental measurements and, and more of them too. Um, uh, Another result from our uh, equation of state table was um, we looked at uh, the sound speed as a function of pressure, and we saw uh, kind of like an improvement in accuracy uh, as our curve kind of like is uh, closer to uh, these latest experimental measurements uh, in this uh, pressure regime up to 150 GPA. So a quick introduction, why sound speed important. Uh, it's important for ICF diagnostics where one can measure the scattered neutrinos that come out of the hot spot. So the hot spot is where um, the fusion kind of has started to happen. And uh, neutrinos come, very energetic neutrinos come flying out and some of them scatter from uh, the material uh, outside. Uh, some of them don't, and based on how based on uh, how many scattered ones you have, you can infer what's uh, called the aerial density, which is like a line integral from the center of the hotspot to the out of the shell. And this aerial density will tell you like how will tell you the um, um, you know how dense uh, your uh, um, your shell has become. And it's uh, related to a quantity uh, called the uh, confinement um, time. So this number density N and the confinement time is, is an important parameter and tells you if you, uh, you know, if it tells you how much fusion you have achieved. But one still needs to know the sound speed as a function of the, uh, 
pressure right? and uh, and density and also temperature right uh, so what uh, oh, sorry not temperature so, so uh, sound speed is a function of density right so and that's usually just uh, taken from uh, equation of state and sound speed can be uh, sound speed is related to the derivative of pressure with respect to density uh, square root of partial pressure with respect to density at constant entropy we can obtain that once you have an equation of state table so back to our results uh, here we have in this region between like 100 and 200 gpa we see uh, um, uh, improvement uh, in agreement with experiment and this is exactly where exchange correlation thermal effects are most important so uh, you know this is um, uh, um, one um, positive results that we took out of, out of this massive project. Um, but the main conclusion still remains that at high pressures, uh, DFT with uh, molecular dynamics, even with the most advanced functional that we have up to date, um, and including exchange correlation thermal effects, is not, is not enough to, to close that gap. Uh, so in conclusion, we've developed hybrids, KDT0 and MetaGGA, uh, thermal scan L, which are uh, thermal uh, exchange correlation functionals uh, to better describe the warm dense matter regime. Uh, we, uh, well, we apply KDT16 to optical properties uh, such as band gap. And we see that it correctly describes the uh, it, it correctly describes the, uh, at least the qualitative trend in the energy gap as a function of temperature, um, and it could provide significant uh, increase in accuracy up to twelve percent in the systems that we considered and the conditions that we considered, and thermal scan L in combination with molecular dynamics for equation of state. Um, um, could provide uh, significant in, uh, improvement in accuracy where exchange correlation thermal effects are important. Uh, but the, this uh, challenging high temperature, high density regime, uh, which is like at the upper part of the warm dense matter regime, um, still needs uh, uh, probably theoretical developments beyond uh, uh, thermal DFT combined with molecular dynamics is uh, you know, one of our uh, main conclusions. So with this, uh, uh, I'm at exactly an hour. <laughs> oh, well, minus the few minutes that we started late. So I'll uh, take any questions. Well, thank you very much for giving this talk.